Get Puck. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Get Puck podcast post draft edition. We're going to obviously dive a lot into that, but uh, first and foremost, some very, very hot off the press news as of the time of this recording. It would appear that Philip Zadina has cleared waivers. So just quickly, Vito, would you have taken a flyer on him? No. Really, yeah? I no. feel like the majority of people didn't want to. Um, for the most part, I did see quite a few people saying, oh, it's a low risk, uh, high reward, new scenery, kind of akin to the whole uh, Leas Anderson sort of uh, acquisition that they just did. Um, I'm a little surprised, maybe not from a house perspective, I'm a little surprised that he cleared, like, just across the board. Nobody went and took a shot on this guy. It's very uh, telling, isn't it? I mean, I, I guess, huh? So that's that's pretty wild. And I would imagine, I would imagine... If I'm going to add my two cents on that, on this, is that... All right, go ahead. How many more of the same style of play, players do you want to have on this team? We already have too many players to begin with. Well, that's true. We're so where are you going to fit Philip <laughs> Zabina? If you're going to just take him just to dump him in, uh, with a rocket, then there's no point. Not really, anyway. If you can't fit him in your top six ro- top six lines, uh, sorry, in your in your top six, then there's no point in even bothering because he's not a bottom six type of player. He's based on skill. He's based on shooting, and and it's just his game is it's taking some time to, for him to find his game at the NHL level. If he ever it's, finds it, uh, it's it's a little bit wild, I have to say. I mean, we snap back a little bit to to the draft where the Habs were drafting third, and then remember at the time, it's all fun to look back now, right? You know, everybody's talking about oh, they passed up on Kachuk. How could they have passed up on Kachuk? That wasn't the guy. That wasn't the guy. At the time, it was a pretty sure shot it was going to be Zadina or it was going to be KK. That was the big topic. Which were both mistakes. Yeah, well, go figure, right? I mean, it's all looking back now. We can all look back and say, oh, my God. But they passed on Zadina. That was the the meme, the lady with the big uh, face. That was the meme. Like, everybody was expecting Zadina, and they went with uh, Cook and Yemi. So now we go and find out that both, would have probably, maybe, possibly fallen down the crapshoot the way that they actually well, did. Okay, Kotkine- between Kotkaniemi and Zadina? Kotkaniemi oh, you take KK, there. without question. Yeah, uh, clearly. Right? He's today, in the NHL, yes. he's playing, he's got them a long-term contract. There's a but both shouldn't have gone himself. third, is my point. Correct. Yeah, that's that's where I'm going with it. Okay, so just a little fun fact there. So Zadina clears, so everybody who was like, oh, another reclamation project for Gorton and Hughes. So scratch that one, guys. He's uh, he's waived and cleared. Um some some more topics to go here. So just, again, before we get to the draft, so Le- Elias Anderson gets picked up, a two-way contract, one-year deal. And uh, wait, was it one year or two years? One year, two-way one, deal. Uh, two-way, one-year deal, right. Um, this is a guy, again, most people probably know this by now, but for the odd chance that someone's listening and they don't know this, this is a former seventh-round overall pick. First-round seventh overall pick. That's what I said. You just, you just said I seventh, said seventh round. round. I'm all yeah. upside down. Yeah, okay. First round, seventh overall pick by the New York Rangers when uh, Jeff Gordon was there. So this is his guy. And I believe Bobarov was there. Nick Bobarov was there as well at the time when this uh, when this pick happened. So both these guys, a lot of sway, a lot of, um, in, um, a lot of pull, obviously, in the direction of what they see the team going. Um, and they're like, yes, we want to take a flyer on this guy. It hasn't worked out. It didn't materialize very well for the kids so far. Uh, they get him in here on the cheap, cheap. Um, obviously, they see the untapped potential still. It's a super low risk, high reward scenario again. Um, and I, 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 for one, I mean, I can't see why anybody would have any beef about this. I'm curious, Vito, like you got what your what your opinion is on this no, one? No, they're they're taking a flyer on him. Uh, it's a de- for now. It's a depth add. Uh, maybe the kid the, the kid finds his way and. And whatnot, but he's probably Laval bound for now. He did very well so, in the sure. AHL last year, so yeah. chances are he's going to head to the to Laval, Laval Rocket. And listen, hopefully the Habs don't have an injury plagued season like they did last year. And if they happen to have a season like that, then they got some depth. They can call up Elias Anderson who can come and play in the NHL and fill in a couple spots here and there. 
I think I think ultimately, I mean, it's just funny. I mean, again, right? And this is on the coattails of the draft. So the fan base as it stands today seems to be very like jacked up, right? Every move that that the Canadians do, either requiring depth for the AHL because they lost the plethora of players, so they have to replace them. Every signing that they do is marred with people coming out of the woodworks, still upset by what happened at the draft and taking it out on every single move that they end up doing. So it's a little bit weird. I don't know why. I mean, I do know why, I guess, but it's unfortunate that it that one um, instance of the draft has now really polarized the fan base into different camps. Um, and that's sad to see. Um, I mean, of course, everybody's welcome to their opinion. And uh, and I'm sure if you caught our live stream of the draft when it happened, you'll know that Vito and myself were actually quite surprised by the pick. But that isn't to say um, that we were taking to social medias and talking about burning down, you know, the Bell Center and 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 going after the kid personally. In fact, right after the, you know, sort of initial shot cleared, we kept saying the same thing over and over again. This is going to be a good player for this team. He's he's the guy now. They made the well, selection. And, and we said to support the team regardless of who they picked. Well, and, and that's exactly it, right? So it's a little bit disheartening to see that so many people went down that road and attacked the kid personally. I don't want to speak too, too much about this because I believe the dust has settled a little bit from that point on. It was uh, it was crappy to see. It's upsetting. I know there's some feel-good stories. There was two, um, two fans on Twitter um, that ended up uh, compiling a bunch of nice tweets and nice comments that were made, and they gave the book over to Reinbacher uh, personally. I thought that was a really sweet thing for them to do. Um, and hopefully he understands that it's a very vocal minority that that was voicing their displeasure with it. Again, wasn't the pick that I think you and I would have done, um, but ultimately we don't work for the Canadians. We don't work in the NHL period. We're a bunch of nobodies that sit at home and make uh, comments and make a podcast about a team that we happen to cheer for. If that team goes out and selects this person, it's because they believe this person is best for their team in the long run. And so we support the decision, and we and and we know. You're getting, I mean, this is, I'm going to coin your phrase, you got the best defenseman of the draft. Now, we've gone back and forth about be it the best player, best defenseman of positions and what have you, but fundamentally, this is going to be an outstanding uh, player for this team uh, for many, many years to come. So diving into that now, let's talk a little bit about it. So we clearly know that David Reinbacher was picked fifth overall. So where do you see sort of the mindset behind the pick? Like, like, ex run it through me. Pretend you're now explaining from the position. It's been done already. You can go find clips from the Habs themselves. But pretend, Vito, you work for the Montreal Canadiens. You were in the war room. And explain to me and everyone listening why the Canadiens picked David Reinbacher. They got a kid that at, he's 18 years old and is six foot two at 194 pounds, who's very mobile and has a very, very mature game already at the age of 18. Is he perfect right now? No, he's not. Which which eighteen year old kid is perfect? They all got to figure it out. I mean, even Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews, once once they got to the NHL, had to figure things out, and their game only got better. No, I'm not comparing Ryan Bacher to them. It's just I'm just my, I'm just trying to say that even the best players in the world had to adjust. Now, with that being with all that being said, he he's I I had him when I was looking at everything. I had him up there in my. Uh, three top three picks let's say maybe four i just you know was hopeful for will smith and you know that that you know how i really thought that the Montreal Canadiens at a point we're going to get will smith that's why we yeah, put up the taking it four and, by san jose though, so, so you, so they, they could have never got him no they could have never got him so when you yeah. look at it he's a right-handed defenseman which right-handed defensemen who are mobile and big are scarce in the nhl and i had read an article somewhere that the average right-hand defenseman gets paid about $450,000 more than a left-handed defenseman. Equal talent and everything. And it's just that's how scarce it is. So now when you look at Montreal Canadiens, I'm trying to like put myself in their shoes. When, when they had somebody like David Reinbacher available to them and everyone was saying that he's the best defenseman of that draft, and you look and say, okay, if we draft David Reinbacher and his ceiling is a top-pairing defenseman, but his floor is a top-four defenseman, yeah, and if you look at the Montreal Canadiens' defensive prospects, they've they've pretty much cemented the back end for the next seven to nine years. So just to to go go through this, you look and you say, if okay, they all you, pan out, 
if they all pan out. But I so think far- it's fair. It's fair to say that too, because a lot of people. I don't. I don't want to interrupt you too too much there. But it's a lot of people coming out saying, "Look at this. Look at the back end now. They're set for life. They are likely going to be very well off." But you cannot put your 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 flag down and say that's it. They can make no more adjustments on the back end. They're good for the next ten no, years. It makes no, no sense. No, nobody's saying that you can't make. Oh, any people are saying that though. Right. Which is but wild, it's, it's it, what happens is that it doesn't become a, a focus as much as as it probably was before. You know, yes. M- the Montreal Canadiens haven't had a quarterback defenseman since Andre Markov. Some would say Subban was that guy, but I still say it's Andre Markov. He was the quarterback. If anybody remembers Andre Markov and the way he would quarterback a power play and do some of those streamlined passes that nobody even expected across the ice for a one timer to players like Mike Camilleri and so on, like w- the Montreal Canadiens haven't had that since Andre Markov. Now, I'm not saying Reinbacher is that guy, but Lane Hudson could be that guy. Logan Mayu, to a certain extent, could be that guy. Montreal was clearly missing depth on the right-hand defense, okay? And and all they had before drafting Reinbacher was Logan Mayu and Justin Barron. Now they add somebody like Reinbacher, who, by all accounts, um, people are saying that he's a two. He ha- His ceiling is a two. Now, could some people peg him as a one, depending on what your need is? And it depends what your view is of a one is. Like, some could say it could be Caden Gooley or Lane Hudson down the road. It depends what you value as a one. Do you value a shutdown defenseman who really plays all, uh, all an all-around game, who can control a play, but at the same time block out and defensively be responsible and, uh, and be one of those guys? They could be a one to some people. Some people, one to them is... A quarterback guy who's going to put up 60 to 90 points as a defenseman nowadays. It all depends, right? Some might look and say, hey, uh, number one guy to me as a defenseman could be a guy who puts up 50, 60 points, but blocks you out completely. And it becomes one of the top defensemen year in and year out. That could be a number one. Look at look at uh, Charlie McAvoy, for example. Again, not comparing Ryan Bacher to Charlie McAvoy. His numbers are great. He is, he puts up points, but he's not putting up Kale McCarr points, but he's still a top five defenseman in the league. Top five defenseman? Top five to seven defenseman. Yes, he is, <laughs> in my opinion. Okay, okay. Let me quick you. revision there. I mean, listen, I, I, I'm i in agreement with you. I, I like the analogy about him where if he hits his ceiling, he's like a one-two and his floor is a top four. And if you can grab a guaranteed top four, guaranteed right-hand shot, right-side defenseman, these are rare commodities. I, I, I'm in a full agreement with that. I think given the opportunity, that's what you should have. You should always strive to go and get. I think when we look back at the draft, part of me was saying, and again, it looks like this was proven that I would have been wrong, but where my mind was before the pick was announced, if you want Reinbacher so bad, if this is your guy, and according to reports, you had five-ish offers on the table, I find it odd that out of all of the offers that were presented to him, uh, 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 Gordon and Hughes, that none of them fell in the, you know, seven, eight, nine range, move back a little bit, acquire some more stuff, get some more picks, get an asset or something like this, or force that team to eat one of the contracts you're so desperate to get rid of, and then hope that Reinbach is still there when you make the when you make but the he wasn't going to be there so now we come to know now I didn't know this I'm not plugged into to everybody's picks of what they were going to do prior to the draft but it would seem that Arizona that was their guy they sent uh they sent people to go watch him over in Europe like 21 times or something I read so he wouldn't have gotten past six we now know this maybe the Habs kind of knew this also and knew that they couldn't take that shot and that's why the offer for the trade to get their fifth had to be so great that they would have taken something so, oh my God, and then settled for whoever was in their second tier of picks. We know that Ryan Bacher was their guy from the onset. Um, likely, I think Will Smith probably edged him out. If he were somehow still there, they would have taken Will Smith instead, I do believe. Um, or if some sick reason any of the other top four guys fell, I think they would have edged well, out The Ryan only Bacher. way the Montreal Canadiens were going to get uh, Will Smith is if somehow Michkov squeezed into the top four. Well, well, that's it, right? If some sort of weird thing happened, that's that's how that would have played out. And I think any of those guys that were taking before Reinbacher would have been ahead of him on the Canadians' depth chart when they were looking at putting the order down of the draft. I think that's just how it was. Um, it would seem that Michkov wasn't really there. 
uh, for them. They, they didn't like the unknowns about him. Uh, I know most fans disagree with this. Um, that's their prerogative. They're allowed to. I don't know how many of them actually seen this kid in action and what most people are going on is likely reports that you've been hearing that this is a generational talent and what have you. Um, but for the most part, that's how fans get um, informed, right? So I see a lot of people make that argument. You didn't see him play. You don't know nothing. Most of the hype is built around these these players from reports that you read from people that know, right? So you can't really attack somebody when they have an opinion about a player and it's you hit them with, yeah, but how often have you seen him play? You don't know anything about him. It doesn't work. We all, all fans make the same assumptions about all these players, and it's solely predicated on information that's fed to us by people that do see him. So the thing about Reinbacher was nobody was talking about him. Now that we've drafted him, uh, you got people out there that are actually coming out saying, hold on, pump the brakes, everybody that's so upset. This is what he's really all about. And I feel like the consensus is coming to terms now saying they did draft a really good player. You can still disagree with it, but ultimately you're settling now on this is I, good. I think, he's not flashy, think, and that's the part that bothered people the most. And he's, they sta he's stable. He's a 50 goal scorer here. He, he's stable. And, and I think what people are also upset about, some people, is that they're looking at the fact that this was a very offensive draft. It was a draft where yes. to get a this was the draft to get an offensive player. And the belief is that next year is going to be very strong defensively. However, however, when you have the best defensive prospect available to you and right-hand defensemen are as rare as they are in the NHL and even to acquire top pairing defensemen of that caliber, of that potential, becomes very costly, I guess they felt that they had to make that move. And they made it. Because... I know some people were writing, oh, Petrangelo, Eric Carlson, and they were naming a bunch of defensemen that you can trade for. Never. It would cost okay? way too much to get now, any of those guys. That, there's, it costs way too much, too much to get any of those guys. Those guys left their teams, went and signed for lucrative contracts, which were way too expensive, and you have to hope and pray that that player wants to come to your team. But when you draft them, we have known, and I've seen that most, more often than not, when the Montreal Canadiens draft players, though, and, and they tend to stick around, provided they don't trade them themselves, they tend to stick around because they've been there from the beginning. Yes. It, we, we've often said, and people have often said, it's hard to attract players to come to play with Montreal. But when you draft them, they stick. Yeah, more and often that's, a whole culture, that's a whole culture thing again, right? Which is what they were trying to do. And that was another thing that got brought up. I mean, again, I don't know anything for certain about it, and I don't want to share misinformation, but there are reports that apparently Michkov wasn't a great guy in the room. Maybe that was another deterrent. I, I, I couldn't I, swear I, to I'm it. Not gonna, I'm not going to go that far. Uh, the only thing that I'll say, and, and, and Kent Hughes has even said it, there, the, the three-year contract that he signed in the KHL is ma made it a bit of an issue. And I, I strongly believe that if he didn't have that three-year contract and he was ready to come over to – next season let's say uh or even the season after he yeah. probably would have gone in the top four maybe not two maybe not three but maybe four to san jose the problem is, is the same thing that a lot of people are not factoring in they're just seeing the the, the, the player himself and saying he could be an 80 to 100 point player maybe he can maybe he can't I however think he will but yeah he's 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 a guy that has a contract for three years now some people are saying he's going to terminate that contract it doesn't work it's not that easy He's gonna, he if he doesn't, contract. it's it's not that bad. It depends the team that took him. I think the perfect yeah, but, team. No, took but him, Matt, way, but. Matt it's, it, it, there is a there's something to consider there. It's three years now. In those three years, you're re basically relying on the KHL and, and the, the development staff uh, uh, and basically the coaching of that team to develop this player. You're uh, hoping that they're gonna play him the full full minutes and not bench him because they know that he's on his way out at some point. There's so many things you're, you're basically relying and hoping that their their development is going to work well with Montreal. And if it doesn't, let's say it was Montreal or any other team, and if it doesn't, then he comes over three years later. Okay? Let's say he does come over three years later. Then it's maybe takes a, a year, maybe two years to uh, adjust to North American hockey. Or maybe so, it doesn't take any time at all. And maybe, maybe his development over there is perfect. Maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe, or, maybe. Or, we don't it's, know. It's, it's a bunch of maybe, maybe, maybe. So... I don't think many teams, with the exception of the Philadelphia Flyers, or eventually would have been the Washington Capitals at the latest, wanted to deal with the maybe, maybe, maybe. The worst, and that's, and that's and then, and there's, the, there's the other angle. Even though the kid said it, 
I want to come to the NHL as soon as possible. I want to come to the NHL as soon as possible. Okay, fine. Um, what if been three years from now, he can't come to the NHL? What if he can't come to North America? There's all I'm these... Big, what if, then what I would have rolled the up? dice, is you my opinion about it. I would have done the it. Guy, the guy just lost... Also, I, gotta, I don't want to bring this up too much because rest in peace. Is he lost his father. And who knows what that did to his psyche at the moment and what's going on in his family and all that stuff. So there's a lot, there's a lot of going but he's on. Not, with he's not coming this right year. Now. Like he'll have the time. And I, I mean, you're seeing a lot of like red flags and it's likely that a bunch of those or maybe all those factored into the Canadians not taking him. It could very well be. I mean, much to the chagrin of maybe people listening that don't want to believe this, but maybe they simply just had Reinbacher higher than Michkov. Now, maybe, maybe. maybe. Again, I think the biggest thing at play here is you had this kid that's going to be a sure shot NHL defenseman, right hand shot, right side. Sure shot. He's playing the NHL, this kid. Is he going to hit his ceiling to be to be seen? But he's going to play and he's going to be serviceable and he's going to be good. And he's going to be yours. And you're going to get him much sooner rather than later. And you get the and controls development. It's, but, but the thing that the, the different, and you get the controls development, of course. The thing about it is, um, you made me lose my train of thought here. But uh, <laughs> but um, it was best player uh, available for a position of need. I think that's how you look at it. Because when people talk about do you draft best player available or draft for need, I'm always more prone to go in like best player available, right? Like you take the talent, you go after the best player. In this instance, the argument here is they didn't draft it's not like, for example, to, to just come up with a scenario that they were in the mid-20s and that now it's like, whatever, there's good talents on both sides and the best player of every position has already been taken from that draft. And they decided to go, oh, we need, we need defense. They took a defenseman, but there was clearly a, a much better player up front. This is the best defenseman prospect of the draft that was available to them. To take a little bit from what you were saying before, Vito, they did draft for a position of need, but they took the best player available for that position of need. And so to me, when I look at it that way, it kind of it kind of alleviates the pick a little bit. It I, again, I still don't I still don't agree with it. But it's, it's also it's I'm also cool not a, it's it, not a pick. I, yeah. It's not a pick that like they most scouts had a, had this player ranked 15th and just because he was the best they took a, he, he was he was he somewhere was 5 to the, 12 or something. Some 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 lists had him at four, or they were starting to say that teams were considering him yeah, at four. Yeah, no, I think some the had majority him at eight, had him in the low, in seven, the low, um, some had him yeah, at eight, five. nine, ten. It was, it was, it was. Uh, no matter how you see, it was a top eight pick. That's a fair, I, that's a fair average. It's a fair average. They took him a little bit sooner than than he probably might have been picked, but again, they had that need, and he fits that need perfectly. Now you hope that he tr comes over and transitions perfectly into the NHL, and he hits that ceiling. That will silence everybody. If this kid, who's still growing, is a will. big boy, has tremendous talent, if he hits the ceiling, this is a home run. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think it'll silence everybody because there's going to be a, a contingent. I of mean, everybody who's rational. I mean, you're going to have people uh, that'll be angry uh, about uh, this uh, forever. Uh, yeah, so like I'm not talking the about only the way, fringe. The only way, only way it'll silence the the contingent of the fan, uh, certain fan fans, sorry, that are uh, pro Michkov is if Ryan Bacher does become a one-two, and Michkov becomes a dud. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. I guess. Or he it's, doesn't it's, live up to the 80, 80 to 100 point hype and he becomes more of a... Or a million... You know, you listen, know. listen. There's the a, difference is, the difference is the draft is over. You have this kid now. This is your guy. Yeah, like, 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 you got to get behind the team. And, and again, you could disagree. It is perfectly acceptable to disagree with the selection and still be supportive. That is what a fan does. That's a true fan of the team. They made the pick get behind them this could be their first blemish or it could continue to be um a good uh progression into where the plan is going with uh, gordon and hughes for the team so far in my opinion it's yet to be to see, yet to be seen about the draft pick but in my opinion they haven't done anything bad yet so why should we just say oh this how could they how could they it was a shocker move past it 
understand it now. Lots of media has come out. They've done they've done a lot of interviews. The kids done the the development camp. If people were lucky enough to watch it, they could have seen him in the scrimmage uh, earlier today. In fact, of this recording, he was paired with Lane Hudson, and they were doing some pretty nice stuff out there. Um, you see you see the raw potential. Let it play out, and let's see what happens. So I, for one, welcome David Reinbacher to the team, uh, and I hope uh, he has a very 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 um, successful career here with Montreal Canadiens. And so, I think he will. I, 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 I think so. I think so. Um, moving, moving. Also, I want to talk about because I don't believe we discussed this either. So Alex Newhook, they uh, they made um, they made an acquisition for Alex Newhook, who's coming in. Interesting thing that was mentioned about Newhook uh, was that they are going to give him top six minutes, and so if he slots on the top six. And they brought him in, and they signed uh, uh, Rafi Harvey Pinard also to a two-year deal. So he's also signed. They have so many forwards that are on this team. So before I get to the question of what do they do with them, we we kind of played this game a little bit earlier, you and I, about making the lineup, like pretending now that only people can go. They're not going to get anything else in. Just with the players they have, what does the top uh, the top six or, or the full lineup, the, the full top 12 look like? And so you and I have some differing opinions about this. Not dramatic, but um, hypothetically, if I throw this out to you, you tell me, would you be, given where they are in the rebuild, would you be comfortable icing this uh, as your day one first game of next season? So... Everybody's healthy. Let's assume no one gets hurt between now and the start of the season. Everyone's healthy. And nobody and nobody's been moved. You have your, your Dvorak is still there. Everybody's there. Well, well, we'll play with that in a moment because let's pretend they can't get rid of anybody, but people have to get scratched. There's simply too many of them. So we'll see who you, who you would scratch versus who I have. So looking at the top line, I have uh, Caulfield, Suzuki, and Doc as my first line, which I'm very happy with. I think that's a very good first line. It doesn't make I, me have a, that. It's a, it's a little bit. It's a little bit yeah. disappointing that Doc is not playing center, but I, I, we're assuming is. in this scenario, in yes. this scenario, we're assuming that they weren't able to trade away any players. They yes. weren't able to trade away Dvorak. Hoffman That's is right. still on the roster, so you got to play That's with what right. you got. That's okay. right. So again, caveat, keeping all that in mind, there is our preferred lineup, but this is what I believe it's going to be. New hook, Monahan, Slavkowski. No. Now, now this might not be two or two, three. Like it's just it's another line. So that that's another line I have. Then I go RHP Dvorak Anderson. No. And then Armia Evans Gallagher, with Pizzetta as a as a scratch. No Pitlick down in the AHL and Gallagher. Hoffman is somewhere. There's no way they're putting Gallagher on the fourth line. So, okay, where is because he go <laughs> because Marty Saint Louis confirmed an oppressor that. Their plan with Alex Newhook is to is to play him in the top six. Yeah. So the way to I top six go. Okay. And again, Christian Dvorak is still on the team, and yes. Mike Hoffman is might still be a team, healthy scratch, but somewhere. Barry. That's right. But he's somewhere, right? So we gotta. Somewhere. I'm playing. I'm playing with what they got today, which yes. is July fourth. Okay. By the time this is released, it'll be July fifth. Now. Uh, I got Caulfield on the left, Suzuki as center, Kirby Doc as the right winger. We're in agreement. Um, yes. 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 Second line is where things differ between you and I. Okay. Is I got Slavkovsky on the left, Alex Newhook as a center, and Josh Anderson as a right wing. Third okay. line, third line is Christian Dvorak as the winger. Sean Monahan as the center and Brendan yeah. Gallagher as the right winger. And the reason why I'm putting Sean Monahan over Christian Dvorak in the middle is because I think they're going to want to maintain and maintain him in the center role to also maintain his value if provided he stays healthy for the trade deadline. So okay. and because depending on faceoffs, this that uh, you know if they kick out Sean Monahan out of the faceoff circle, it's just put Christian Dvorak and he's a fifty percent pluser anyways. Then. Um, fourth line is Harvey Pinard, Jake Evans, and Joel Armia with Pizzetta being the extra. I don't think Harvey Pinard's going to complain about uh, being on the fourth. He's just not that kind of guy. He's just a hard worker and he's a workhorse. And injuries happen, as you saw. And, and even if an injury happens to someone in the top line, which we hope he doesn't, Harvey Pinard could just move up, up the lineup. 
Yeah. So I'm just putting yours next to mine here, just taking a peek. So again, we have the same top line. We're in agreement. You see Slaff moving to the left, which I guess is more his his, his actual side. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And Josh so, okay. Anderson is a righty. He, he's more often than not, he's a righty. Yeah. Right. So, 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 so you, you know, like he skates and he puts his shoulder down and cuts towards the left. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, yeah, Slaff, Slaff on the second line on the left is perfectly fine too. You, you see New Hook. Well, we had to put New Hook on, 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 um, on at least the top six because that's what they claim they're going to do. So he's your center. Okay. And Anderson on the right. Fine. Then you make the decision that Dvorak's going to play wing on the left. Monaghan sits middle as a 3C, which is perfect for where he needs to be. And then you got Gallagher, okay, on your right as your third line right winger, which leaves RHP again. Yes, I don't think he's going to care. I don't like it because I think that he actually elevated his game playing on a higher I, line. I, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think many people are going to like it because people are going to have different combinations. I think that if the if the roster stays as is, now mind you, right now we got 24 players, right? Because you got Chris Weidman and Mike Hoffman in, in on cap friendly yeah. list on this, yeah. they're, they're scratches. But for me, I just think that there's a chance Mike Hoffman, given the what we have, if they're not able to move him, they're gonna just they might bury him in Laval. and there will be some some savings there, not a whole lot, but there'll no, no, be some for sure. savings there. But they they I mean obviously they have to do something, right? Simply it's a it's a it's just a matter of personnel. Yeah. They have too many players. They're gonna. So. I have I have a feeling. And while I have no inside information, I have a feeling they're going to have to include a draft pick of some kind to move on a, to move a contract, especially if it's somebody like Mike Hoffman. They're going to have to pay to move him. They're going to have to retain salary yeah. and pay to move him just to open up the space, the roster spots for for who they have. If now, you ask Nabora, me, I think could be the easier trade, but teams are running out. Of, but teams yeah. are running out of money right now. Well. Listen, we're only a handful of days after free agency. There's still there's still a lot of things that can happen. But sure. if you ask my opinion, if I were to adjust my lineup the way I did it with Dvorak being the guy out and that they're capable of of getting him sent somewhere, uh, I don't know what, if they got to package something, which would ultimately end a terrible sort of situation that happened to what you gave to acquire him and then what ultimately he did here and then to have to pay to remove him like ew, you would never want to talk about that one but if he's the one that's gone i think players will be slotted in better spots where they'll well they'll actually sort of kind of mesh better it's not to say that christian Dvorak's a bad player in fact, I think that when he's on his game, he's actually quite a serviceable third-line player. I, I mean, I think he's actually quite good. I think he's being paid a little bit too much for what he does. He never was able to take that next step in where everybody thought he was. He's kind of maintaining equilibrium with what he was doing in Arizona, playing with, like, nobody. So you thought coming here, giving the opportunity to be uh, playing a little bit more uh, with well, more skilled to be, players. To, to be fair to him... Ever since he got here, this team's been and that's not his fault. Well, it's not his fault. Yeah. Including him. He's been injured. Yeah, right? he's been so injured pretty bad too. He yeah. hasn't really gotten to play with better players. Not really, anyway, because of all the injuries. So let's say to close to close the uh the question, we you've given your top 12, I've given my top 12. Um, and of course, anybody, uh, we, we welcome your comments to give us your top 12, what you think is going to happen. Uh, either give it to us with the caveat of just the players that are currently on the team or what you think maybe something that they're going to do. Maybe there's some crazy thing they're going to do and they're going to get somebody else. Maybe Jonathan Taves shows up and he's like, I've always wanted to be a half. Oh, oh, no, no, I'm just kidding. Good. But whatever. Sh give us your, your predictions of what you think the top 12, top six might be. And uh, we'd be very curious to go through those. Um, but the question is, if they do nothing now, nothing at all, and just that, with that top 12, is that something that you're comfortable with with them riding into next season? Given that we're still in a rebuild, yes. Yeah, me too. Me too. Given that we're still in a rebuild, yes. And barring any injuries, they will be more competitive. It, it, I would be a little surprised if they end up being a bottom five team again, but yes, it wouldn't surprise me it. if they're a bottom 10, 11, 12. So that's what I was going to say. Where do you put them? Because I think, honestly, I think if they don't get injured, my prediction is that this team is going to be in the low teens is where they're going to draft. 
which is not a great place to be. It's not, oh my God, terrible. It's not like 19, 20. I think they could be 12 at 13, something like that. I think they're going to overachieve for where they're currently at. If players take the next step, if Doc continues the, the, the progression, if Suzuki and Cole, uh, Colefield, Caulfield take a, an additional step, if Newhook could find his game here, if everybody takes that, not leaps, Slavkovsky, if everybody takes a step, they're 100% better than a bottom five team. And I think they're going to actually be better than the bottom 10 teams. I do. The only thing that's going to put them behind is because everybody on in their division and everybody in these, most teams in the Eastern Conference got that much better. They're, they're very good teams. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's where it's a bit challenging. But Montreal is on a very, very good path right now. Um, I, it's going to be good to, to see that I, there's no reason for them to focus on the defensive side anymore. I still think they need to put some focus on their goaltending uh, for now, at least. Uh, I like Monty and Allen, but there's still question marks there with Monty, whether he is a true number one. I know we know Dave's sentiments about that. I yeah. don't think Sammy is a – Sammy. Sam Montembeau is, like a, is a true number one. I would love for uh, Kent Hughes to go and get uh, a goaltending prospect or a goaltender in the – Askarov, Levi, that they, category. They could have. Right? They could have. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> you have enough for the fifth overall pick, stuff. So. I understand. Um, and I, it's just now it's finding the way to get Kirby Doc to be the 2C and not put him on the right wing. Even though he's doing very well as a right winger and was doing very well before he got hurt, uh, playing with Nick Suzuki and, and Cole Caulfield, everybody has to stay healthy. That's what, that's what I want. I want I want everybody to to, to progress. I want to see uh, the next the next level for a lot of these players. But it's staying healthy is the important part this year. And we'll see what the new uh, ther therapy staff and medical staff will do with the Montreal Canadiens this year. I mean, yes. It, it, like I remember that being a, a story for a day. It's like only in Montreal could the new therapy guys get like uh, top media attention. But hey, listen, if they are that good and they come in and they keep everybody uh, healthy and everything is good, I mean, this could be a very exciting year. I mean, I'm not expecting anything. Oh, my God. I'm not expecting even playoffs, to be honest with you. But no, if no. they stay healthy, if they can stay healthy and they can actually show progression and everybody moves up. Again, you made a great comment to the fact that they're in a tremendously difficult uh, division and all of the East teams are like juggernauts now. So... It's going to be hard no matter what. And obviously, I don't believe that the team is stacked at the same place as these other guys in the East. So they might all – they it could be that the entire team ends up elevating their game and they still don't make a lot more progress in the standings. But that would be fine. That would be fine. You give me entertaining hockey. We have, we have storylines to follow with all the players making strides and moving and advancing and getting and showing chemistry, which is important. And then you also get a decent, another decent year of drafting at a decent level. And then who knows with all the wheels and deals that Gordon and Hughes can do to maybe get more of that kind of currency uh, leading into the next year's draft. So it's exciting. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Clearly in this offseason, I do believe that you're going to see contracts go out. I don't know how exactly, be it that they're going to have to pay to remove them or they make some sort of unbelievable deal. Um, we called it right for the, for, we didn't even mention poor Eddie, uh, and, and thanks for all the years there, Eddie, but we said he'll likely be gone for sure before free agency. And he was gone, I believe the day of, um, so, so he's off and now the bottom six, obviously they don't have to jostle so much for a spot. Everybody seems to be locked in pretty good. Um, we'll see what he can do. Um, and that, and that will be really interesting going to start the season with, with the lineup that either you or myself uh, presented, I think either one of those, you're not going to be like, Oh my God, Mike Hoffman's on the top line or, Oh my God, Dvorak's your two C. Oh my God, this is terrible. I think they got a lot of promise. We don't know if it's going to work out. We have, we're not, no, we're no Notre Dame this year. We have no idea. But the pieces on the paper show that there is promise. Did, it's did, young. Did you just call Notre Dame? We're not Notre Dame. Nostradamus? How do you want there to you go. Nostradamus. All right, All right. So, I'm happy that they got RHP signed for basically Rem Pitlick's contract. I know I call that. Uh, you did? I, that that would be the term. I said a two-year bridge deal of 1.1 million. I just felt yeah. like it just made sense to give him Rem Pitlick's contract. The next contract that I think we're going to see is obviously Alex Newhook, and it's probably going to come in and around the Kirby Doc contract. Um, I expect it to be somewhere around there. 
in my opinion. People might, some people might say it's too much. Uh, some people might say that's about right. Um, it just makes sense. He produced very similar numbers to Kirby Doc when we acquired him. Mind you, he's More not the uh, important to note. Important to note. I know a lot of people don't know a lot about New Hook, but it's important to note that when they acquired Kirby Doc, and Doc came in here and took that next big step, New Hook's coming in here already technically ahead of where Doc was when they acquired him. They're not the same players, and you never know how it's going to materialize. I just want to throw that out there because everybody's like, "Oh, New Hook, why are they doing?" Yeah, that? you could trade. You could trade off some things. One guy won a Stanley Cup. The other one is six foot four. Like. One's one's more of a center. The other one is a center winger, but is more likely probably better suited for the winger. Yeah, one's a much more passive skater. Like, they're not identical players, but yeah. there's a lot of parallels there. There's a lot of similarities into what their situations were when they were both acquired. That's right. Well, that's awesome. And so we're going to end it there. I think we went through a whole bunch of topics today. Main takeaways here for, for all of our listeners. We're curious to know what your lineup is going to be for opening night. If you want to throw that down in the comments, we'd be happy to comment back and discuss about what you think it's going to be. Um, you can simply just agree with my lineup. You can agree with Vito's lineup or Tinker and put your own. And, and, and we'd be very curious to see what everybody comes up with. On top of which, we also be curious to know about your comments now that it's been a few days and the dust has settled. How do you feel about David Reinbacher being picked at fifth overall? Uh, we'd like to get your takes on that as well. So eagerly looking forward to that. Um, we're going to be back probably next week. I'm not sure if we have our reschedule with our special guests, but please keep uh, an eye on our Twitter for all the updates on that one. Uh, we're very excited to get uh, to get him on. And on that note... Once you got anything else you want to add there, Vito? I'm good. You're good. So for Vito, I'm Matt, and this was Get Pucked.